We are back with Randall Carlson, master builder, architectural designer, teacher, geometrician, geological explorer, and uh, podcast host. And we're talking about, well, the great year. So let me just uh, see if I can sum this up to make sure I understand it. So we've got the 26,000 year cycle, which is called the great year. Uh, and this uh, 26,000 years is is the completion of the procession of the equinoxes as it works through all uh, 12 of the zodiac signs. A and each zodiac uh, sign, or uh, it, work, it takes 2,160 years to get through that uh, procession. That's a month. That's a cosmic month, 2,160 years. There are 12 months, 12 zodiac signs. So 2,160 times 12 is 26,000. That's the great cosmological uh, calendar. And you were talking about Solon, this uh, ancient Greek political leader uh, who lived before Plato. He goes on a, a field trip and he's speaking with the, the Egyptians. And they're telling him, Solon, you're, um, you Greeks, you have no concept. You have no memory of what has gone on before. Um, you know, you're living in a particular season, but you have no knowledge of what came before or what is to come. Do I have that kind of... I right? think you really, yeah, you, that was a great summary. I, I think you did a great job, Richard, um, as far as where we've gotten so far with it. Um, why don't we pick up with Plato, where we left off? There's a few more quotes here that would be good. We 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 uh, concluded before the break with the um, his reference to a declination of the bodies moving around the earth and in the heavens, declination you know, from the word declination, it comes from decline to descend downwards. And there are actually traditions that Plato was most likely referring to a comet here. And there's traditions about the myth that he referenced, the myth of Phaeton, uh, also being a comet. And I don't know how uh, you may familiar you or the uh, listeners might be with the myth of Phaeton, but it was Essentially, in a 30-second version, he was a son of Helios, the sun god, but uh, by a mortal woman. But he did not know who his father was, and so he's at school every day. And all of the uh, all of his school, the peers at school, are always bragging about how great their fathers are. So he comes home and he's, you know, expressing his um, disappointment that he can't, doesn't know who his father is. So finally. His mother decides to reveal to him, well, your father is none other than the sun god. And to make a long story short, he eventually manages to go to find his father, uh, the sun, and then he uh, and then he, he goes to the palace of the sun, and he manages to convince his father to let him drive the chariot, his father's chariot. And, of course, there are four great mighty steeds that, that drive the chariot. And when young Phaeton gets there on the reins, the steeds immediately knew uh, that he wasn't going to be able to control them. And after flying through the signs of the zodiac, they decline off the zodiac and descend to earth. And in the process, they set the earth on fire. Um, the chariot, as it descends to earth, sets the earth on fire. And eventually the oceans start to boil, and Poseidon uh, entreats Zeus to do, intercede and do something about it. So Zeus hurls the thunderbolt, and it strikes Phaeton from the sky, and he falls into the river Eridanus. And his sisters, uh, symbolized by the Heliades in the myth and in the constellation, they weep for the death of their brother, and their tears fall to earth and cause the great deluge. So, so this myth is, good. yeah, this myth is explaining how, you know, typically the, you know, this, well, not typically, <laughs> the sun rises in the east, sets in the west. And the, the, in, according to mythology, this was explained by, you know, the chariots, uh, the chariot is, is pulling the sun across the sky. On this particular yeah. occasion, they had a rookie driver and he yeah. messed up big time. But you, so they yeah, were, that, they, yeah. That's it. I mean, you, 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 that is a, the essence of the myth. And then, um, but the, to me, the, one of the interesting things is clearly a very explicit reference to something that could be interpreted as a comet. Uh, and the second thing is this: the correlation of the 
interaction between the Earth and this comet, followed by a, a great flood. And we see similar evidence for such an actual occurrence uh, during the Younger Dryas at the end of the last ice age. And in fact, what we see from the evidence in the geological record is that there may have been at least three gigantic flood episodes that uh, were associated with the transition of the Earth out of the previous uh, glacial age into the current interglacial age. And in fact, Plato kind of goes on. He's talking here about, um, you know, the, the, the survivors of such events. And so when he uh, he talks about in some cases, it's people who live in the mountains that will survive. In other cases, it's people uh, who live uh, near the sea. So this is the, the what he goes on to say. That when this happens, when after this declination of the bodies moving around the earth and into heavens, when this happens, those who live upon the mountains and in dry and lofty places are more liable to destructions than those who dwell by rivers or on the seashore. And from this calamity, the Nile, who is our never failing savior, saves and deliver us, delivers us. When, on the other hand, the gods purge the earth with a deluge of water. Among you, herdsmen and shepherds on the mountains are the survivors, whereas those of you who live in cities are carried by the rivers into the sea. And this is a reference to the fact that most of the ancient cities were along ri established along rivers, waterways, or along the coastlines. Now, one of the things that happened, of course, at the end of the last ice age is with the melting of all the great ice sheets over uh, North America and Northwestern Europe, uh, sea levels rose uh, as much as 400 feet, maybe more. And so whatever human habitations or settlements or colonies or cities would have been along coastlines at during the late glacial maximum, you know, 14, 15, 20,000 years ago or so, they're now under 400, 300 to 400 feet of water, right? So that's one way that ancient civilizations could be destroyed is by rapidly rising sea levels. The other is that most of the during these tra great transition episodes, like this is what that was. I mean, to get the planet out of a full glacial age into an interglacial age, you're talking about a major transition type of event. Uh, that right. Involved, flooding. It's going to be flooding. Oh, yes. And, yeah, because here's what's happening, Richard. R the estimates are is that there were at least six million cubic miles of glacial ice more than there is now. And so if you can picture the North American continent, you had an ice sheet that reached from the northern United States up to the Arctic Circle and from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean, completely buried virtually all of Canada, up to a mile and a half thick sheet of ice. Now, because all that ice is accumulated, sea levels have dropped a proportional amount. Because what's happening is that the sea, that the water is being evaporated from the sea, and typically what will happen in northern climates now, that moisture in the atmosphere precipitates out as rainfall, where it immediately goes into the creeks and the rivers and is conveyed back to the oceans, or it goes into the groundwater, which also eventually works its way through the hydrological cycle. But yeah, it's kind of a close system. It's kind of a close system that the amount of water on the earth is kind of constant. It's either tied up in the ice or then it's, or it yeah, rains down exactly. or melts. Or, yeah. you, you, you got the picture exactly, Richard. That's exactly it. So as the water is evaporated from the oceans, precipitated out on land as snowfall, now typically what happens, let's say, let's even up, in Canada, all, virtually all the way up to the Arctic Circle, come spring and summer, the winter's accumulation of snow melts. But now imagine you have a winter's accumulation of snow, but it does not melt. And then next year, there's another uh, precipitation of snow, and it doesn't melt. And this goes on for thousands of years. And eventually, you've accumulated a pile of ice over a mile thick. Now, this is a 
really extraordinary and remarkable process that we still don't really have an explanation for for what happened. Okay, so now go the other way. Now, meanwhile, because that water is not being recycled back into the ocean basins, ocean level is dropping as the ice mass on the continents is increasing. Now reverse that when the ice starts melting, it's shrinking back in in mass and the ocean level is rising, right? And so it's almost as if the planet has got this built-in cycle. It's breathing. The, the ocean levels rise and fall. The ice masses expand and contract and sometimes disappear altogether. And this phenomenon has been going on for hundreds of thousands, in fact, for several million years. Right. These are seasons, back, right? We're these are seasons. We have we have the you know four seasons in a calendar year. Well, they 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 cross over calendar years, but we have four seasons. But cosmologically speaking, just as we have a great year of twenty six thousand years and a and a and a cosmological month of twenty one hundred and sixty years, we also have these seasons. Um, yes. the, you know, winter would be an, an ice age that could last you know twenty thousand years or more. Yeah. Interestingly, Richard, the last ice age lasted about 13,000 years. Uh, now, there's the, uh, the glaciologists and paleoclimatologists, they look at, like I was talking about earlier, they'll look at, at records going back, say, a quarter million years. And you can see the fingerprints of ice ages uh, throughout that quarter million years. If you look at the last four cycles, of precession. If you if you do the calculation, you'll get 104,000 years uh, will be four cycles of precession. Interestingly, four cycles ago was the end of an interglacial period called the Eemian, and it was considered to be the closest analog to our modern interglacial cycle, which is called the Holocene, and is usually dated to having started at 11,600 years ago, which occurs, which coincides with a number of things. One, it coincides with the end of the Younger Dryas. The beginning of the Younger Dryas was about 12,900 years ago. It lasted about 1,300 years. And then at about 11,600 years ago, it came to an abrupt end and there was a massive global warming event. This warming event caused uh, an accelerated melting of the ice sheets, and marine geologists and oceanographers have identified what they call meltwater pulse 1B. The dating of that is at 11,600 years ago, and that is also the date that coincides with a major global climate change, which caused the which was associated with the end of the younger dryas now since we're talking about plato here what's really interesting about that date and anybody can look this up now online and go type in the holocene or the pleistocene holocene transition and you will see that the date given is a right at 11,600 years ago well going back to plato in that same dialogue that I was just reading, he says, uh, Plato's talking about how the priests explain that there is a, um, that there is a, uh, their sacred registers go back uh, 9,000 years, and their sacred registers go back to the time of Atlantis. And in the two dialogues, Plato, you know, speaking for the Egyptian priests, gives the details on this great war that occurred between Atlantis, that's very clearly described as existing on islands outside the Straits of Gibraltar, which were in ancient times called the Pillars of Hercules, right? And right. their antagonists who were uh, the, the cultures that were inside or around the Mediterranean. But here's the interesting thing. He talks about this great war comes to an end, and then there's a great cataclysm that causes an extreme erosional event on the Greek peninsula. But at the same time, tremendous earthquakes and 
along in the Atlantic region that causes the rapid and catastrophic subsidence of Atlantis. Now, the interesting thing about that is this occurred, as they say, 9,000 years earlier. Well, the date that that uh, Solon is usually given to have gone to Egypt was about 600 B.C. So you can do the math, the 600 B.C. plus 2,000 years plus 9,000 years it brings us right smack on to 11,600 years ago. At the very date, it's like Plato is giving us the date. And we now know that there was a very extreme melting event associated with a rapid sea level rise. And in my Atlantis, I have, for those who are interested in diving deeper into the Atlantis thing, on my website, you can go and find about a nine-hour, two-part lecture that I have given with all the quotes from Plato, the graphs, the science, uh, to try to show that uh, try to give what I've done is I've tried to explain it using science, but being very consistent with Plato's very explicit details. That well, what's that? We're going to his two we're, dialogues. We're heading into a break here, but when we come back, what's interesting is how the ancients knew uh, this, how they were able to see so far back into the past. Uh, yes, they could observe the stars over long periods of time and see the procession of the equinox and so forth. But to be able to go back like 26,000 years and and predict these cycles, these are predictable cycles of cataclysmic events. It could be an ice age or it could be something seemingly random like a comet slamming into the earth. How did they know? We'll, uh, we'll f- find out when we come back. Randall Carlson stays with us. Randall Carlson is with us, master builder and uh, geomythologist and uh, podcast host. And the uh, the new podcast is going to be launched very soon. It's called Squaring the Circle. So um, you've used the analogy, Randall, where, you know, there are, imagine that we're in August, right in the dog yeah. days of summer. And we have no memory. We only have a memory of the last three months. All we have a memory of is summer. So the season of summer, we don't understand that if we go back, you know, six months, we're into winter. We have no memory of winter, but there are some, you know, these, some of these, these ancients like the Egyptians who spoke to Solon of ancient Greece, they have a memory of these, these cosmological seasons. That, that go back thousands and thousands and thousands of years. So they understand this cycle, this, uh, and the, and the cataclysms that come with it. How could they, how could they see so far back? Well, it, it, it implies things that don't really conform to our models of ancient history. And that's wherein the problem lies. Um, can we make the assumption that there have been cultures that were able to preserve traditions for thousands upon thousands of years, even going back into prehistoric times. Uh, until recently, I think such an assumption would have just been derisively dismissed by academics and gatekeepers of established dogmas of ancient history. However, I think we're in a position now where we're having to rethink all kinds of things about our own past on this planet. Uh, As the age of modern humans gets pushed back farther and farther from a few tens of thousands of years now to a couple of hundred thousand years, it opens the question of what could have happened before in ancient times that may have been lost or forgotten. And interestingly, Plato, again, gives us insights into that as he goes on into uh, his dialogues. And he's talking here specifically about Atlantis and the uh, the way it was originally uh, created by the gods, Hephaestus and Athene, who were two of the gods, a brother and sister. And uh, so they had a portion of the land. As it says here, in this this early first incarnation of Atlantis was naturally adapted for wisdom and virtue, and there they implanted brave children of the soil, 
and put into their minds the order of government. Their names are preserved, but their actions have disappeared by reason of the destruction of those who had the tradition and the lapse of ages. And he goes on, he says, for the survivors of each destruction, as I have already said, dwelt in the mountains. They were ignorant of the art of writing and heard, heard only the names of the chiefs of the land and very little about their actions, as they themselves and their children were for many generations in want of the necessities of life. They directed their attention to the supply of their wants, and of that they discoursed to the neglect of events that had happened in times long past. For mythology and the inquiry into antiquity are introduced into cities when they have leisure and when they see the necessities of life already beginning to be provided, but not before. And so there we, I think we have a very important, uh, some very important evidence that has been introduced that we need to, to introduce in, integrate into our conceptual framework of the ancient times, because he's telling us that in the aftermath of these catastrophes, basically cultural traditions tend to get lost. Um, because why? Because the, the survivors are wholly preoccupied with the challenges of just surviving from day to day and being able to provide sustenance for them and their, their children and their offspring and so on. Now, I have hypothesized for years that when we begin to realize that these destructions that Plato is talking about are not merely metaphorical or mythological, but real, um, as he goes on to say here, he says, I would have you observe the present aspect of the country, which is only a promontory extending far into the sea, away from the rest of the continent, and the surrounding basin of the sea is everywhere deep in the neighborhood of the shore. And again, it's a reference to how the sea level has risen 400 feet since these ancient times uh, that, that they're talking about here, 11,600, right. 12,000 years ago. And then he goes on to say this, many great deluges have taken place during the 9,000 years for that is the number of years which have elapsed since the time of which I am speaking. Uh, the consequence is that in comparison with what then was, there are remaining in small islets only the bones of the wasted body, as they may be called, for all the richer and softer parts of the soil having fallen away and the mere skeleton of the country being left. Now he's talking here about what happened to the ancient Hellenic civilization that that led the in the the cultures within the Mediterranean into this great war with the Atlanteans, and and the interesting thing that a deal t detail that's generally overlooked is that Plato describes almost a twofold catastrophe that engulfed not only the Atlanteans out in the mid Atlantic, but also the Hellenic, the, the Greek peninsula that underwent this tremendous extreme erosional event, which again is consistent with what would happen during massive flooding, because massive flooding can cause extreme erosion of whatever sure. is there. So interesting, Plato provides a lot of details here that may be relevant to our own scientific understanding of these events in the past. Um, he says here, in former days and in the primitive state of the country, what are now mountains were only regarded as hills. And the plains, as they are now termed, were full of rich earth. And there was abundance of wood in the mountains. Of this last, the traces still remain, for there are some of the mountains which now only afford sustenance to bees. Whereas not long ago they were still remaining roofs cut from the trees growing there, which were of size sufficient to cover the largest houses. And there were many other high trees bearing fruit and abundance of food for cattle. So he goes into this description of the previous state of the, the country, and he's referring again here to the, to the Greek peninsula, 
and whatever civilization was there before this catastrophe and the state of the countries. Then there was this great catastrophe that not only wiped out the pre-Hellenic civilization, but at the same time as Atlantis was destroyed thousands of miles away. So important point here is that when these destructions that he's describing uh, occur, and we're not going to, of course, have time to really get into it too much here tonight in this discussion, the scientific confirmation of so much of what Plato is saying here and so much of these, the, the tradition and the details of the tradition about cyclical catastrophes and so on, again, the point that I'm trying to make here is that we seem to be in a, a, a phase now where science is confirming the veracity of many of these ancient traditions. Now, right. here's an important point. If you have a destruction comes on like this, like, for example, if you have a, a comet impact. Now, to in present times, generally a comet impact could be predicted years in advance. We have the scientific, the astronomical capabilities of predicting such a thing far in advance. However, primitive cultures that may be even in the earth today, but, you know, more and more, even the so-called primitive cultures are getting, you know, they now have cell phones, whereas, you know, tribes that were a couple of generations ago had never seen civilization now have cell phones. So, but if we go back 50 or 100 years, let's say there was going to be a, a great impact event, most of humanity would not know about it. Okay, so if there are tremendous cataclysmic environmental changes, gigantic floods, fires, and so forth that destroy civilizations and only leave scattered survivors, those are the ones that Plato is talking about when he talks about, you know, they're going to be so wholly preoccupied with the necessities of trying to just exist from day to day that they're not going to really have the opportunity to preserve ancient traditions, ancient science, ancient learning or knowledge. But what if, on the other hand, there were some percentage of the people, some group of people that knew about the catastrophic cycles and, in fact, uh, existed for the sole purpose of preserving knowledge, wisdom, information, science, et cetera, et cetera, when these pre-existing civilizations are destroyed? If Let's just hypothesize for a, a minute that there could have been a priesthood that had existed for centuries, if not millennia, that could have uh, existed for the primary purpose of preserving knowledge about these great cycles, and which the, when these nodes of vulnerability to such things might occur again. And those are the ones who, I would again speculate, were the ones who survived and were able to preserve knowledge. And, you know, as Graham Hancock points out and other researchers point out, is that it seems like at the very dawn of our modern civilization, you know, 4,500 to 5,000 years ago, it seems like there was a tremendously sophisticated and advanced knowledge of a whole number of things. Uh, the whole point of Hamlet's Mill was that, well, hey, we have to push back this sophisticated knowledge of celestial motion to at least a thousand years before conventional uh, history had acknowledged the same. Right. Now, and those those, in, those with the knowledge would head for the hills because they understood the, you know, uh, let's say the long count calendar of the Mayans, for example. They understood, yes. you know, when the change of the, the cosmological seasons were coming uh, and they would head underground or head into the mountains uh, in hopes of preserving not only their own lives, but also the knowledge. But uh, we're coming up on a break here at the top of the hour. But uh, things like, um, you know, these cycles of cataclysms, the the ice age, the ice ages uh, seem to be predictable because it was a season. But something like a comet, while it might seem random, um, there's also kind of a, a, a cycle there, too. Right. With, yes. with By looking at the conjunction of planets and so forth. We did talk about that somewhat, didn't we? Yeah, we did. Yeah. So we can, if you want to get into a little more on that, when we come back, I'm more than happy well, to. Yeah, let's, we got about uh, three minutes here. Let's just begin that conversation about how you could predict a, a collision with a comet. 
Okay. Well, number one. Okay. So we know just like, let's take a very kind of a mundane example. Halley's Comet. We know that it comes back every 76 years, right? So I remember Mm. going out there, what was it? 19, let's see, it came by 1986. I remember going out to a, a, a place near where I live. It's called Panola Mountain hiking up to the top of the mountain with my binoculars and things and, and watching the comet. And the last time it had come through had been, was 1910. And I, there's a, you know, the famous story about um, Mark Twain, who was born while Halley's comet was in the sky, uh, you know, 76 years earlier. And then he always made the prediction that he would die when Halley's comet came back. And sure enough, that year, when Halley's Comet was in the sky, Mark Twain passed on. Well, <clears throat> so there we already know that comets are on regular orbits. Now, there are two types of orbits of comets. One is that they are elliptical, and the other is that they're parabolic. What's the difference? Well, an elliptic, ellipt, an, an ellipse is a closed, uh, a closed loop, okay? Uh, a para- parabola is an open loop. So if a comet comes in and you can study the mathematics of its orbit to determine whether it's elliptical or whether it's parabolic, if it's elliptical, that means it's a recurring thing. You know, Comet Halley is on a recurring cycle of 76 years. It, it, it's an ellipse, uh, which is one of the conic sections. A parabola is a conic section, but like I said, it's it's open. So If a comet comes in or any kind of celestial object and it's on a motion whose trajectory traces out the geometry of a parabola, that thing ain't coming back. It's just making one loop through the solar system and then it's out of here. Those are the ones we got to watch out for. (laughs) Well, um, well, let's take a quick time out, Randall, um, top of the hour. And then when we come back, we'll get back into uh, comets and... um, uh, pre- the predictions of uh, these cataclysmic events. Back with more of our conversation right here on Coast 